something interesting happened. What's that? This is 2020, mm -hmm. right? And we had a uh, distributor from South Africa, okay? And yeah, of course, the first thing they do is send it to the biggest network, which is Netflix, of course. And then they sent us a message from Netflix saying that Netflix are not going to take the film. They like the film, but they're not going to take the film unless we turn it to color. Oops. Oh. Yeah. But they have a film on there that's in black and white. It's <coughs> in, in with the Zendaya, I think? Yes. Okay. That was, that was even before that. Okay. So this is 2020, and they reject uh, Goku's Lounge because it's black and white. Okay. I'm going to say this for the first time on your show. Uh, okay. I cried eventually. After two weeks after that, me being like, okay, I'm cool, cool, yeah, what's up, it's all good, it's all good. I cried. Me, at the time, I was like, what, how old was I, 34, 35 years old? I was on a floor crying. And the last time I cried like that, I was like seven, six years old. Kaimo, my father. Kaimo, he knew you. Meet me at the Gold Coast Lounge. Meet me at the Gold Coast Lounge. Welcome to this episode of Your Guide on Ghana, where I tell stories from Ghana and the African diaspora. Today, I am with an award-winning filmmaker, Pascal Aka. He is Ivorian, but grew up in Ghana and also went to school in Canada and returned to the continent. He is a phenomenal filmmaker doing amazing work. And one of his films, Gold Coast Lounge, is on Netflix. So I'm so happy that he was able to carve time out of his busy schedule to talk to me today and share his journey. And just to shed some light on the fact that there is a growing film industry right here in Ghana that needs some attention. People need to know about what's happening in Ghana. People hear about Africa and they just think about Nigeria and Nollywood and sometimes South Africa, Kenya, but Ghana has a lot that's going on too. So thank you so much, Pascal, for coming in today. Thank you for having me, absolutely. I want you, I mean, I did a quick brief introduction of you. I want to learn a little bit more. I want the audience to learn a little bit more about you. You're from Ivory Coast, but you grew up in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I got here when I was about uh, five years old, after my fifth birthday. Uh, we just drove to Ghana. Um, my dad got a job at, uh, to, to help set up Ecobank. Mm. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so I first was in a French school, um, Francaise.com, when it was in Roman Ridge. So I, was, um, so I attended a French school for about six years before I transitioned to English school, um, Ghana International School. A GI. Ah, you're a GIS guy. Yeah. Uh, or I should just say DIS, that about international school. Let's get it out of the way. Yeah. yeah so, um, so yeah, I would say I'm, I'm an international kid. You know, I'm a West African, uh, francophone, anglophone, and yeah. So when I was um, when I was in GIS for like six years, afterwards I just went to Canada. I enrolled at the um, Columbia International College. It's called a college, but it's really a high school. Uh, it's a high school, international high school that really helps people transition from um, transition into the Canadian university system. Okay. And honestly, like if you're from any country outside Canada, I would recommend. I would say that's a place to be if you want to transition into um, the, the Canadian university system. So um, it's like sort of a boarding school, but it's like I would say a fancy boarding school. You know, I mean, security cameras everywhere and then like uh, access cars and buffet wow. setting. And I, it's not it's not not to brag, but like really, when I say I, I went to a boarding school, like I have to emphasize the fact that it's not like not know. like a Ghana boarding school. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, it's not. It's not. But uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it was, it's a really, really great to help people transition to the Canadian system. So that's what I did for a year. And um, but mind you, before that, I have to talk about the difficulty it is to just tell your African parents that you want to become a filmmaker <laughs> or an actor or all that stuff. Yeah. So, of course, my, my mom was devastated, you know, uh, her child, last born, that's like uh, smart, you know, mm -hmm. quiet, you know, I said, now he wants to become an actor. Like, what does it mean? That's a hobby? So, no, no, no. <laughs> but so, no, I was serious about it. I want to become an actor. It's something that I hid for many, many years because I was sort of shy unless the camera is on me, unless I'm on stage with a script, unless, you know, I'm, I'm making a speech that was written for me. Like, I love speaking in public. Mm -hmm. I love I love rapping at the time. I love writing. Oh, you were rapping. Okay, let's not go. To I'm like that. you were rapping. Okay. So just anything, anything artistic. I was doing it, and like that was my way of communicating. 
uh, from writing stories to um, graphic design to just anything, anything artistic, I was obsessed. And my father was the one that told me to just, he had an idea, I was like, okay, how about you use education to study producing? That's where the money is. Okay. That's why he, that's so why he, he knew about producing. Yeah, a little bit, you know what I mean? Like just be the one who's always involved with the business of, of movies, not the guy who's in front of the camera. So that, when he hit me, he's like, wait a second, director, that, is that what he means? You know what I mean? Because director's in charge, ish, and, and the, he's in charge of the whole artistic thing because the way I was so um, obsessed with all the different parts of arts, including music, uh, so I felt like if I'm a director, I can put all of those things together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, that's what I did. Um, first, I was, I was about to apply at the um, American Academy of Dramatic Arts, um, which is um, it's a theater school. A lot of people went there, Danny DeVito, Michael Douglas. It's not easy to get in, but I did not apply. I ended up going to, after Columbia International College in Hamilton, um, I applied to different universities. That's funny, you were in Hamilton. I grew up in St. Catharines. Ah! Wow. Yeah, just minutes from, like 30 minutes from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hamilton was very, very interesting. I, I thought it was a very interesting place. Um, so yeah, I got a few acceptances in, um, in my high school, um, university. I got Brock. I don't know. Oh yeah, was. Brock in St. Catharines. Yeah, yeah, I got Brock. I got a few. Winster or something? I, I, University I, of Windsor or? Yeah, 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 yeah. More of that, I don't remember. But I, I ended up taking Carlton University, which was in, in uh, Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So I took that, a couple of friends, uh, my, my, my brother's friends were there. So yeah, so I went to Ottawa into the film studies program and voila. So um, I felt the program was interesting. I felt it was very, very deep. It really teaches you how to watch films and analyze films deeply. You know, I think it's, uh, it was an amazing course that really um, taught you how to become a writer, how to read films properly and how to write films properly. And the way we learned different, um, we learned about um, films in different eras and different places all over, all over the world. So mm -hmm. from the French New Wave in France, from of course the beginning of film, and especially in, in America and Hollywood, um, to, you know, we studied some different directors, Spike Lee is one of them. Um, uh, Amadova, one of like and Kurosawa. We, we studied so many. We had different courses, from Japanese cinema course. So what I did, I was so obsessed with the course. I was so obsessed to become the best that that could be. So besides my classes, I um, from the second year I applied as a, um, as a projectionist for different classes. So mm -hmm. after my classes, I would go into other classes and actually, you know, observe the courses, watch the courses, and also watch the movies that were there. So. Um, so I, you, I you, even the master's program, which I did not apply officially, uh -huh. but I was in the master's, master's class. I was there every single day and watching all, all the other movies. So I wasn't there during the exams, of course, but every single um, lecture and movies that so I- So you showed up for the lectures even though you weren't registered? Yes. I was actually getting paid to attend the master's program. Oh. Because I was a projectionist. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so... For someone who doesn't know what a projection is, is what, explain what it is. This is the guy who puts the movie in the, the, the machine and, and play, plays the film. Okay. But besides that, of course, if the, the lecturer has, you know, different slides, I'm the one that, that clicks in, on the different slides and everything. Mm. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty basic. Don't part that's difficult. It's when you actually, they bring a celluloid film. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I have to put the film inside of the thing and... You have to, oh, to my. feed it in. Yeah, 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 that, that, that was tough. I, I hated that. I hated that. So besides Carlton U, um, I enrolled in the, um, at, at a place called IFCO, Independent Filmmaker Cooperator of Ottawa. So it was um, a, a film association in the city where you could actually take uh, workshops, etc. And, and yeah, that's the place that really, I say, really, really trained me, like hands on how to become a filmmaker. So I was so obsessed with that association that eventually I ended up becoming the vice president and a director general. The other, in the other, in the, in the other uh, what's it called? Form, um, Order, yeah, so I ended up becoming the vice president after my third, fourth year. But, so this way begins my career, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so my career began, you can say unofficially, from my second year of film studies. So I didn't have all the knowledge I'm supposed to have, whatever, so I just decided one day, um, okay, I don't have a lot of patience, so I wanna. You wanna just do something? Yeah. You wanna I get wanna your hands into everything? Yes, because there was a sort of an industry over there and I, and I was around it, especially with, with the EFCO, the film association I was in. I saw people shooting and all that stuff. So I was like, okay, I was helping out different shoots, production assistant here and there. And while I'm on set, I'm learning on set, I'm like, okay, time to do my own, mm -hmm. you know? There's two things I can talk about with this transition to uh, my directing. It's the personal, it's also uh, sort of professional, I guess. Growing up, I was a very timid, timid boy. 
I was, I was, I had depression issues. I guess the term mental health exists now. Yeah, it exists. but then it wasn't something people talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so um, I, had, I had huge, 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 huge issues with depression and all that stuff growing up. Um, but before I, I started directing, uh, I told myself, let me try one thing in my life, right? Let me try one thing where I'm gonna apply positive energy throughout. And if it, something goes wrong, don't give up, just keep moving forward and let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I decided to, to direct for the first time, you know what I mean? Because my whole life, ever since I was four, Ivy, my whole life, I had this obsession of walking around my house in circles for hours and hours and hours. Really? Yes, nobody knew what I was doing. Nobody knew what it was. They thought I was crazy. They thought I was, I had some mental issues, whatever. But I was watching movies in my head that were never made. Yeah, so I, for years, mind you, I made a thousand movies from the age of four to the age of 16. I've made a thousands, thousands and thousands of movies in, in my your head. head. Yes, I was just walking around the house, watch the movies, sometimes act them out. Hopefully nobody's watching me. It's because some of them were action. So um, yeah, so I was just creating, creating, creating. So I can imagine how my second year of film studies, after being around equipment, being around all that stuff, I'm like- You're ready. Yeah, I was, I was impatient. So I had to create, so I started right away and uh, I went to actorawa.com, which was it's a website where you like you you apply, you you, you send application as a director, and you apply for actors. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever saw anything like an action film at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I knew how to write it down professionally and everything. So I ended up having over 250 responses in my emails. That alone was the most responsibility I ever had in my life at the time, having to handle 250 50 emails and all the different headshots and organize everything and everything. So that's how I started. And then my first day of shooting, over 60 people that I had to handle with maybe four or five crew members that were my, my, my film studies class and stuff. It was the most difficult day of my life at the time. Um, and, but that gave me a lot of responsibility. That gave me a lot of like uh, confidence mm -hmm. for, um, for what is to come, which right. was going to be my career. So, my career, the, my first movie is called Jamie and Eddie's Souls of Strife, right? It's something that I saw in my dream. So the, the story was about um, a school, right? A secret underground school for spies mm -hmm. and secret agents and stuff. Right? It was in Canada, a place that's not known for war and all yeah, that. Yeah, right? kind of like Switzerland, they're just... <laughs> so uh, the school's about that. So it's, it's focused on two students uh, that were the best in the school. But those two students had their own gang. Right, um, one one once one group was made of white people, mm -hmm. and one group was made of black people. Okay. Yeah, we never spoke about race in the film. But, but you separated, so it was clear distinction. Why? No one ever asked why, but th th that's basically what it was. Okay. One was focused on the, the rock culture. One was focused on the hip hop culture. Okay. Right. So I just saw like I just applied what I saw in the, in the music industry and I applied it into an action film based on, based on students and stuff. So um, that's what the film is about. And throughout the, the process of making that film, which was a two year process, it took us two years to make this film. So basically there was me, a student, full-time student, my second year and third and fourth, right? Eventually. And all these actors that were volunteering their time, right? Including the people who are in my core group. One of them, um, his name is Dennis Lafont, which is a guy that worked at TD Canada Trust but he's trained in stunts in Toronto, he's trained in stunts in Hong Kong, and he's just looking for his big break. So in the meantime, he's in Ottawa, he met me, thank God, and then we all formed our own small stunt team. So it was like four or five of us, the core team, and we would train two, three times a week. And Did you do stunts? I, he, ended up, he ended up training me. Wow. Yeah, 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 he ended, I, I didn't know anything, right? So he, he, he's trained, he had, he had the certificates and stuff, and he works at a bank, so okay, we're making a movie. So Pascal, if you're acting in the movie, so I'm gonna have to train you, blah, blah, blah. So my first movie, yeah, I, tra I trained, I learned everything through him. Um, I, was, I was a co-star of the film as well, I acted in it as well, so I, I had to perform and stuff. That's where I learned a lot of things hands-on. And so yeah, so that's our first film, Jamie Nettie's Souls of Strife. And we eventually, we sent the film to a film festival in LA called Action on Film Festival. And um, yeah, it's a film festival where like, um, that's based in Pasadena at the time, uh, California at the time. And uh, yeah, we ended up getting, we had two nominations, I think, at the time, and we ended up winning Best Action That's Sequence. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that must have been, felt so good for your first major project. Yes, yes. yes. that gave us a lot of confidence. And then we had a lot of, so again, press attention around Ottawa and stuff. So that was really, really, really life-changing. 
So that's the first movie, and, and eventually we work on the second movie, which is called Evo, E V O L. That's love spelled backwards. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So it's pronounced Evo, like E V I L. Yes. But it's love spelled backwards. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm giving you everything I'm leaving behind. Three million dollars to a good man like you. John Hardy's final request when he last consulted us was to assign you as the contingent owner and beneficiary of three life insurance policies. Of his children. He had kids? Never be jealous when good things come to bad people. You don't know what's coming to them. So um, with that one, it's uh, I, I would say it's a much better production uh, because because you were experienced from the yeah, first one. Yeah, and by that time I graduated, and by that time I pressed attention here and there, got better crew, better better actors and stuff. Uh, not better actors, but you know, but and by that time the, the stunt team was also very 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 solidified and stuff. So um, and I stepped behind. I was still acting, but I stepped behind the camera from the stunts and stuff. But um, but yeah, Evo as well, like, you know, we ended up making it and, and we sent it to a festival as well. Same festival, we got Best Audience Choice Award or something with more nominations. So it was great as well. So, uh, and from there, we didn't know that was gonna be our last project because at the time after we did a second movie, everybody, all my, my, my team started getting uh, huge opportunities. Dennis, my main guy, ended up being signed on a movie called Scott Pilgrim, directed by Edgar Wright, yeah. Yeah, so let me tell you a story about Dennis, right? Um, there was a time when we started, this guy would train three times a week. We were all trained three times a week. So at some point he decided to take a little break, get married, which is fine. And, um, but at the time he got an opportunity. When he stopped training, he got a phone call from one of his friends in Montreal. Mm -hmm. who could get, into it in, 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 get him in the industry because it was a Hollywood, Hollywood movie that, 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 that came to Montreal. And then they, they say, hey, Dennis, I got a spot for you. Um, there's this movie com coming in, it's called 300 Spartans, and I can get you a spot because they're looking for dark people, etc. And he asked them, Dennis, you still have your abs, right? Yeah, so the moment that he decided to stop training, get fat, eat whatever, and get married, is the moment he got an opportunity. Oh, wow. So the timing. They said the timing was bad. So that's when, like, eventually he called me back and said, Pascal, let's, let's keep, keep working. So we kept working for two more years, and then he got another call for a movie called Immortals, which is a bit like 300. Shot in Montreal, starring Henry Cavill, and uh, Mickey Rook was still big at the time. And then, yeah, so they, they all got in, and then uh, that's when it happened. So we premiered that second movie, Evo, around that period. And then I think two weeks later, right after that, I started getting focused on my music video career. All right? So it was doing well. I was making okay money. We're negotiating for a movie for like $1.2 million. A movie called Deceit that we're working on. I was like, okay. And then during the, one of the shoots, Okay, I get a phone call from my brother and say that, that he's dead. So you have to go back home. So yeah, so just right from that phone call and all that stuff, and the next day, boom, I had to fly all of a sudden to, to, to uh, back to Ghana, which I visited a few times, but this is my first time coming like in a serious situation. So yeah, so that's how I came back to Ghana. Mm, but you didn't have to stay. It wasn't my choice. It wasn't my choice coming back to Ghana. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so I lost a parent. I only had one parent left, which is my mom. Right, right? yeah. Uh, and I was really not close to my mom at all, um, especially when I, was, when I was in Canada. So she would call, hey, sweetheart, I'm busy, I'm shooting. Yeah, but my, my dad was supporting my, my career, literally. Money, anything, all that stuff. And he's the first one to believe my career, actually. Okay. My mom did not. Well, my mom did not, but my dad really saw the vision at some point. Yeah, so when he passed away, he really hit me hard, and it's like, okay, what am I gonna do? So back home. I'm in Ghana, uh, culture shock. Things are a lot different <laughs> than it was back then. A lot of things have changed. Yeah, I decided, okay, let me, just, let me just shoot a music video or something. Okay, let me just shoot a music video. And then, um, yeah, so my first music video was uh, for Tic Tac, which is like a legend that I grew up listening to. Great, and I, and I, watch, sh I shoot another video, another video, and then the opportunities was very, very interesting. Because mind you, when I was in Canada, one thing that was stopping me from getting union work and all that stuff, because I was applying for my uh, permanent resident. I needed to be a permanent resident before signing to ACTRA as an actor. Right, and for those who don't know, ACTRA is the union in Canada. Yeah, the Actors Union in Canada. Yeah. So um, I had an agent, the biggest agent in, 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 in Ottawa, uh, which is um, Monceau Agency. Uh, shout out to Kat, Kate. 
Um, so yeah, and um, yeah, so I wasn't part of the part of the union. I wasn't part of the uh, most. Of, I wasn't Canadian permanent resident, so uh, that was making things get difficult. So it was taking a while for me to receive any income besides the music videos I was doing, right? So, but I was in Ghana. I was getting paid. I was getting an opportunity. Boom, and then eventually I met and worked with this artist called E. L. Right? Mm, yeah. yeah, so I shoot one video for E.L. Explodes, his career explodes. I guess my career explodes too. And I shoot the second video and the third video. And next thing you know, my name is, yeah, it's making waves and stuff. And it's like, okay, you know what? I think I'm supposed to be here. So here's one thing. You know what, Ivy, I'll tell you this. I never told anyone this in the past 10 years that I've been here. Oh. I did try to go back to Canada. You did try to go back to Canada? I did. Okay. I did apply. Mm -hmm. Um, because after I came here, I wanted to go back one more time to say goodbye. Yeah. I think to my ex at the time, maybe to sort of see Dennis Child or whatever and everything. But they refused. I got rejected. I don't remember too much of the details, but I got rejected. And then it's like, okay, I guess my brother went there to get married and stuff. I stay here. And my career was blowing up. Mm -hmm. My career was blowing up. So, um, yeah. And I picked my career from the ground up and everything and stuff. And it's been great. So at the end of the day, as much as some people may think that, oh, Pascal, you're doing big things in Canada. Actually, I was not, if you think about it. I was on a come up, right? I was, you know, I was doing independent films, low budget independent films. And yes, the people I was with are now working in the industry. Mm -hmm. I go to Silverbird Cinemas, I'm watching X-Men. And all of a sudden, I'm jumping, I'm almost crying. And I see Dennis. People, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I see yeah, Dennis right there, there being, being killed by Mystique. And I'm like, what? And I see, I see Dennis, I see Moose, Alain, I'm like, what? I started with these guys and now I'm seeing them in the $200 million movies and stuff, it's amazing. So De Dennis, you know what he worked with? He became the Will Smith stunt double in the Suicide Squad. So working alongside Will Smith and so much stuff that I can keep up, keep up with. So it's great that I started with these people. I'm very, very proud and stuff. So um, by the end of the day, I'm a spiritual kind of person. I'm a very, very spiritual kind of person. And I feel like, you know, everything I do is based on instructions that I get from the spirit. And I was meant to go to Canada and I was meant to come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everything that I've done since I've come back has given me so much fulfillment. Financially too, it's not bad. I'm happy. I'm, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and personally, and also like my soul, I really feel when you're here and you do the work that you feel you're supposed to do, and you know it's making an impact. Yeah. There's no money that can actually, you know, uh, give you more value than that. Because I could have gone to Canada. I could have, you know, I could have continued my career. But if I did, like, what would I be? I would be what there already is in abundance over there. You know what I mean? If I could be here and actually be a pioneer in the music industry, music video industry, and help help us set up, help help make it big, like my father did with Echoback. He started when the Bank was just starting off, and next thing you know, a few years later, he's managing the director. Next thing you know, a few years later, he becomes the CEO of Bank, the whole Africa. Mm. It's like, you know what? If I respect this man, it's like, and I'm a filmmaker, let me do what he did, but with film, okay? So basically, that is what I feel is my assignment. And my assignment is to be a filmmaker in Ghana and help build the industry and take it to the next level, which so help me God, as much as I can. So with the music and video industries, let's talk about that. Um, I blew up at a time when Ghana music was actually blowing up. 2011, 2012 is what people will call the Azonto period. Yes. It was a time where I felt was very, very interesting because growing up, let's say 97, 98, that's when hip life started. Yes. You all listen to the radio for many years, you hear Kojo Entry, you hear the high life music, all of a sudden you hear somebody rapping in the street like, what? Someone's rapping in the tree, you can do that? I mean, we knew people could do that, you know? You watch those, those talent shows, but now on the radio, you hear Reggie Rockstone, Reggie Alsaya at the time, rapping in tree. And the next year, the whole airway is filled with people rapping. Hip hop, but Ghanaian. So I thought it was interesting. So I leave Canada, come back after a decade. Not only do we have our own, the, the rapping is there, it's been there, but now the beats, the actual instruments, we mixed up our traditional sounds with the hip hop. And now with the dance moves, we mix up the hip hop with our traditional moves like, yo, we are here now. This is who we are. Because I knew that from there, something big was about to happen. Mm -hmm. We have a gold mine. Yeah. We have a gold mine that is pure African and can be exported. We heard stories about, you know, these African-Americans, you know, that sell products like, okay, I was watching a, um, a, a daytime show and this girl was, was, you know, selling product called the, the, the Sapon. Yeah. 
Yes. I'm like, oh my yes. goodness. Yes. So I'm like, at the same time, you think to yourself, okay, it's doing well, but you think to yourself, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Yeah, but we, people aren't doing it. Yeah, we take what we have, package it, and sell it internationally. That's basically what Hollywood did to me uh, for, for many years. I learned how to speak English by watching Hollywood. Before I went to America, before I went to New York for the first time, I knew what the Statue of Liberty was. I knew what the Twin Towers was. God rest his soul, the Twin Towers. I knew what you know, Las Vegas was like, because they advertised mm -hmm. their identity, their culture to us throughout. They programmed us. So while I was shooting those music videos, I felt, okay, now it's our turn to showcase who we are, advertise who we are, package ourselves for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So up to now, right now you talk about African music, definitely Ghana is in the conversation. Of course, when you mention the Burner Boys and all stuff, you mention our Stone Boys. When you, when you mention the whoever, the Whiskers, you mention our, our, our what's it called, Shatawales and Sakwa. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and now we have more artists that, that, that are making ways internationally. Mm -hmm. Our music industry is doing well. So I was there for a while. Um, I was in the music video industry and I trained people. I trained people to be great music video directors. And around 2018, 2017, I felt that, okay, the music industry is doing well and it's going super up. Music video directors are doing amazingly well. I want to leave. I want to stop. So you're ready to change? Yeah, I was ready to go back to my first love, which is movies. Film. Film. Yeah, so I quit music videos. A lot of people were not happy about that. I'm sure, because you, you've made a foundation and yeah. people know you as a go-to and then all of a sudden... Yeah, yeah. A lot of people were not happy about that, but then just something told me that, you know, I kept having these visions for this, this movie I wanted to do. Um, so, um, first in 2016, I did Black Rose, which is a short film, okay, which ended up being a proof of concept for what ended up becoming Gold Coast Lounge. Now, um, what Gold Coast Lounge is, um, Gold Coast Lounge is... What I did is I took a film genre, one of the film genres that I studied first in my first year of film studies, and I took our culture and I put it all into one. So first I was experimenting, like I was thinking like, what, 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 what is this thing that I keep seeing? So I ended up making it happen with, with, with Black Rose. And then, so with, with Goku Lounge, what I knew I wanted to do, what I knew was important, was to find what it is my identity is as a filmmaker, as a writer, as an author. Just like me going to film studies the first time, there was a lot of ideas in my head that needed to be projected, mm -hmm. you know? And Goku Slot is just one out of a thousand. Imagine, this is the kid that spent so many years walking around the house watching movies that were never made. So I had to leave music videos and I had to create my own stories because there's a, there's a reason why these images are there. Mm -hmm. So Goku Lounge is a political metaphor. I am not much of a political guy, but for years we've seen who we are as people and, and how we're struggling. And, and so it's just a movie that metaphorically just explores the idea of what it is to be independent. Are we truly independent? What does it mean to be independent? And have we done a good job? Mm -hmm. Are we supposed to be independent? So let me tell you a little bit about the story, not going too much. So what I did, I made a movie where it's focused on a crime family. You know, think of a mafia or whatever, but set in Ghana, right? Dressed like, you know, film noir gangsters. Yeah, it was film noir style. Yeah, exactly. But with, with a little bit of, of uh, African culture in there. So, um, so basically this family, they operate, um, they do their operations in this special lounge of theirs, which they're very connected to. So people go there, you know, like they party, they, you know, buy the drugs, prostitution and all that stuff. And then the government tells them, you know, we give you guys three weeks to fix everything, or we arrest everybody and you're gone, okay. So this family decide to unite, okay, so what are we gonna do? So, um, so and the family ended up becoming divided. Mm -hmm. One family believes that let's be independent, let's start like, you know, making our own clothes, you know, have, have our own musicians, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other family said, no, like if we get rid of our white partners, we, 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 we're gonna fail. And we should keep doing drugs, we can keep doing all, all that stuff because that's how we, 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 we've, we've always done it, you know. Um, so this idea of independence versus, you know, this neocolonialism is how um, these two parties, these two families are separated. And they're separated like two political parties. Right, right, which is kind of like, I feel like a metaphor for Ghana, very two-party. Let's not go into it too much, but yes. 
<laughs> yeah, so they're divided like two political parties and end up, you know, being in conflict. So add a little, you know, um, love triangle in there. Right, yeah. right. Don't give away too much because yeah, we yeah, want so. people to watch it. It's on Netflix right now. Yes, so. absolutely. So, so that was Go Coast Lounge. So is, I would say as an, as, a, as, a, as an artist, it's the most different thing I've ever done. If you see me as a, if you see my career, like all the action films I've done, not too many, but all the action films I've done, the music videos I've done, one, the film's in black and white, which I was, I don't think there's been any black and white. Yeah, people don't really do black and white film, no, unless no. they're trying to make a, an artistic expression. Yes. Yes, which people don't do. In feature films in Ghana or anywhere in Africa, people have not done any black and white films, not many. There's one in South Africa a few years ago. Um, so, but uh, unless you go to the Kwanza film from, from back in the day, of course. So, um, I don't know that, visually it's very unique. Mm -hmm. The film is very, very unique. Like we created our own cinematography system with this film. We try to create our own genre with this film, Afro-Noir, that's what we, we call I it. I like that. So it's film noir in an African uh, uh, context. So it's very, very artistic, very metaphoric, and, and, and it's 170% in our local language. I don't speak Ga, my tree is not the best, but uh, I made sure that the film feels, smells Ghanaian. So the lead actor is called Alphonse Menyo. He's very, very proficient in Ghana. Uh, very good looking guy. Of course, you have to make sure of that. Very good looking, strong guy, and, and he's very African. So he's the guy that will lead all my films, like forever, as far as I know. Um, he's not the most popular actor in the world, in Ghana at all, but he's mine. He's the perfect fit for what I'm trying to do. He's purely Ghanaian, is very proficient in Ghana, and, and this, so that's someone that I'm taking uh, in, in, in my journey. So he was the lead actor of Black Rose, the short film, and the lead actor of Go Coast Lounge. So when we did a Go Coast Lounge, we went to Nigeria, Afrif, Af African International Film Festival, Afrif. Yeah, that's the first film festival that accepted Go Coast Lounge. Before that, let's talk about Black Rose, though. <laughs> When we did Black Rose, I felt it was the best work I've ever done in my life. Wow. And I, yeah, yeah. We were so proud of what we, what we accomplished. It was so beautiful. The film is so, it's on YouTube right now. It's so beautifully done, so, so poetic. So we sent it to so many film festivals and Ivy ended up getting 28 rejections. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it was- But that's tough when you see something you love so yes. much and you feel you've done such a great job and to get so many rejections. Yes, yes, yeah. So no one accepted uh, Black Rose, like 28 rejections. So that put me in a depression for the first time in a long time, whatever. Mix that up with me breaking up with my ex at the time, whatever, fun. So yeah, um, yeah, I, was, I, wasn't, I didn't know what to do with my life at the time, but thank God we didn't give up. We still ended up doing Goku Slouch, which is crazy because we felt that, okay, we know what rock bottom is. We're familiar with rock bottom. So if we do, we do it again and we reach rock bottom, we're not, it's not gonna hurt us. We're already on the ground. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's only one way to go on that's up. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? If we say where we are, we say where we are. Yeah. That's fine. You know what I mean? So, uh, so we felt like, okay, so what are we gonna do? Fail? We've done it already. Like we're, we're, we're professional failures. So, you know, it's not gonna hurt us at this time. So we did the Go Coast Lounge. It went smoothly. Well, of course, there were some difficulties, but it didn't affect us because everything that went wrong ended up switching to something great. Because our lead actress from, from Black Rose, we cast her for Go Coast Lounge, but then she got pregnant, she gained weight, and then so we, we had bigger costumes for her, and then she couldn't do it anymore because she just gave oh. birth. So we decided, hey, wait a second, let's cast somebody else, and it hit me, Raquel. You know, she, she, she's a singer, but she hasn't sang in a long time, and then so we called, she flew from London, and the the measurements of the girl that got pregnant was exactly Raquel's measurements. That's perfect. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> it, so we didn't have to do new clothes for Raquel, so it was perfect. And she sang the song so well, which I wrote, you know, and she acted the role perfectly. So shout out to Raquel, who did amazing. And Ajati Hanam is in El Zoo. And also myself, I acted in a movie as well. Um, and yeah, so all the festivals that ended up rejecting Black Rose, for some reason, accepted Go Coast Lounge. It's a feature film, or that short film, they, they, they refused. We don't know what happened. It could be you were ahead of your time. Maybe they weren't ready for Black Rose at the time. Yeah, but at the same time, I don't know. Maybe because it was a silent film. I have no idea. Yeah. I, I don't know the, your answer. Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that. But um, yeah, so um, Afrif accepted Go Coast Lounge and we had a, a jury special mention award thing. So that, that went pretty well. And then Ghana Movie Awards. We swept, swept the whole Ghana movie awards. Yeah, you did. Best film, best director, best actor, best supporting actor, best supporting actress, best costume, best makeup. 
nine, nine awards. Best soundtrack, which I, could, I cannot forget. Um, so, Ghana Movie Awards and also Golden Movie Awards as well. We won like six awards. And, um, and something interesting happened. What's that? This is, is 2020, mm -hmm. right? And we had a uh, distributor from South Africa, okay? And yeah, of course, the first thing they do is send it to the biggest network, which is Netflix, of course. And then they sent us a message from Netflix saying that Netflix are not gonna take the film. They like the film, but they're not gonna take the film unless we turn it to color. Oops. Oh. Yeah. But they have a film on there that's in black and white. Uh, with, is it with Zendaya, I think? Yes, okay, that was, that was even before that. Okay. So this is 2020 and they reject uh, Goku Lounge because it's black and white. Okay, I'm gonna say this for the first time on your show. Uh, okay, I cried eventually. After two weeks after that, me being like, okay, I'm cool, cool, yeah, what's up, it's all good, it's all good. I cried, me, at the time, I was like, what, how old was I, 34, 35 years old? I was on the floor crying. And the last time I cried like that, I was like seven, six years old. <laughs> I didn't cry like that when, when, when my dad died. I cried, you know what I mean? So in 2022, fast forward to maybe to like last year, 2022, um, the one, the biggest, um, the biggest award show in Africa, as far as I know, um, AMVCA, Africa Magic Video's Choice Awards. Um, we sent our film to, um, to we applied uh, because we're accepting films from 2022, 2021, 2020. So that's the competition was huge. Right. So we sent our film, and luckily we did get accepted, and we got what? Well, we got two nominations. So we got nominated for um, Ajete and I got nominated for Best Supporting Actor for his performance in the movie, great performance, and. I got nominated again for soundtrack. And so far, every time we get nominated for soundtrack, that psh, we always win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all the awards, including the Africa Movie Academy Awards, we got best soundtrack for that. You make, you write your music? Yes, I do. Yeah, I, that's, I write. That's amazing. Yeah, I write all the music for, for my films here. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's an award show where we actually flew there. We went there, myself, Ajete, Zanel, and uh, Gideon, uh, Gideon, they all came with me, and then we won the award for best soundtrack. Great, so the cool thing about that, it's in Nigeria, and I win Best Soundtrack. And for some reason, this award show in Nigeria is so big, so huge, that this Best Soundtrack award got me more press attention, more than any awards I've ever won at the time. Because that's my 18th award, I believe, yes. well, for, 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 for that movie. That's my 18th award, but for some reason, that award show got pretty room, everything from the embassy, this and that. that like these, these bloggers that I didn't pay, I never paid bloggers by the way, but these bloggers that never wrote about me, like all posting me, like, wow, okay. So this is a big award show, you know what I mean? So it got me to think, you know, at a time as well, you know, I started this whole campaign and just to just shake up all the award shows in Ghana because like they, have, they do this thing where they, they award you, but they don't give you the plaque kind of thing. So like, those are some issues we we'll go through in, in our industry, you know? So it's like, there are some filmmakers in Ghana that are doing great works, that are doing whatever we can, but somehow the system is asleep. Yeah. The system is a little asleep. It's not where it's supposed to be. I actually assume when I won all those awards, the Ghana Movie Awards, I thought all the guilds, the uh, film guilds would just reach out to me, the director's guild, the producer's guild, the crew guild, I thought they'd all reach out to me. I won all the awards. But nothing. Nothing. It's like, it's really, it's like we're really, really independent doing our own They're in their own silos. Yeah, yeah, so the structure is really not there. But that's before the National Film Authority, to authority uh, came through. So that's the time I won the Ghana Movie Awards. That's like maybe two days after the um, NFA was, was inaugurated. And Goku Stan was the first movie that they actually came to watch as, as, as an association. So that was good. I support everything that the NFA does. Now, so, to the happy ending to this story so far is like after the AMVCA, you know, of course, the year before I got engaged to the love yes, of my life. Yes, congratulations. Yay. Yay. And then, yeah, so she set the dates December 30th to be, you know, our wedding dates and stuff. So, okay, myself, family, we know about it and stuff. And then after AMVCA, after a few things here and there, a few screenings and our premiere, um, yeah, the manager, um, my manager from South Africa let me know that, okay, hi, uh, we got a deal from Netflix. I'm like, what? You're like, what? <laughs> I, I looked at emails, like, what is second? Like, I, I, I manifested it many, many, many times, but this is real. It's like, okay, we got a deal from Netflix, da, 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 da. The amount is actually twice as much as they normally paid two years before. 
So that's cool. But then they pick December 30th, which is the exact same day that I'm getting married. What a great gift. What a great, what a amazing what gift. What an amazing, amazing gift. Yeah. So, so um, these things don't happen to everybody, but they, they can happen to anyone if you believe in all that stuff. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, I cried again, yay. It's <laughs> like tears of joy. It's like tears of joy. I don't, I'm not a crier in real life. Mm -hmm. One, as men, you don't, the hormones, whatever. They don't yeah, ask, men but. don't usually yeah, want to yeah, cry. Yeah, yeah. They say so, men don't cry. Men should, uh, Obama ends soon. Yeah. Is that what they say? Yeah, yeah, Obama sure. ends soon. Yeah. But, um, That's what they say. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's true. But then, like, these are powerful, powerful moments. Like, mm -hmm. so you start to think, you know, like, from the beginning, your father supporting you, like how you started in Canada and everything was tough and, you know, and, and yeah, and, and you, me quitting music videos and just me listening to the spirit and what I feel is the right thing to do for myself, for the career and for my country. You know, I did a film that's probably Ghanaian. Uh, I did a film that, the way I've taken everything that I learned from Canada to here, my music video career, my film career, acting career, put it all together into one. I put everything in, into this thing and then it ended up paying off. So I me, mean, what I learned is like, you know, if you go study outside, there's a reason for that, you know, and if you decide to take your skills and whatever you learned, your resources and bring them back home, there's a reward that comes with it personally and also for the, for the, for the country as a whole, because um, I've seen it, I've experienced it. And right now there's some things that are happening that I cannot elaborate on, but um, doing something of service to your country that raised you uh, is actually uh, very, very, very rewarding on a personal level and professional level. So um, since then, um, yeah, there's been great opportunities that are on the way. So I, I know where I am as a director now. Uh, as a film director, it's my job to take um, our culture and package it and explore it in a way that it has never been packaged and, it, and shown in a way that has never been shown from so many different angles. So I, you expect me to take different genres and Africanize it and explore it because that's exactly what happened in the music industry with hip life. That's exactly what happened with Goko Snatch, with Afro Noir. So now uh, I'm the guy that's gonna go in so many different territories that has not been gone before. And at the end of the day, the Ghanaian film industry is gonna be seen. I'm looking forward to seeing what you have in store in the future. I Thank really you. am. Congratulations on all of your successes. Uh, I wanna end on a piece of advice that you would give to a young African who wants to become a filmmaker and they may feel like all the um, things are stacked against them. What would you tell them to do to move forward? Because not everybody gets a chance to travel. They might be here, yeah. born and raised, and they don't know what to do and they feel like they have to travel, but they can't. Yeah. What can they do? The thing is, um, right now, it's easier than before, okay? You can say it's tough because more competition perhaps, but it's easier than before because the equipment is here. And when I started, there was, it, was, it was difficult to get equipment. It was, and the information is easily available, right? You just research and build your way up to eventually get a mentor. I've trained so many directors. I've trained people that are like doing very well in music video industry, the Sprint's Doblo, that's one. Um, and also the, the people that make documentaries, people that do events and weddings. I've trained so many people and they're doing so well. So um, right now, there's no excuse, you know? Um, you are a seed. What you believe is, is a seed. And if you feel you're in the dirt, there's nowhere else to plant it. Plant your seed in the dirt. So start while you're broke, start while you're, you have no resources, start start now. And eventually your, your beautiful flower will grow into a beautiful tree. Thank and you. I'll be there. Thank you, thank you. You heard him. Plant your seed now and it will start to grow. Don't wait. Because if you wait, the time is gonna pass anyway. Yeah. So you might as well do it and then see what flowers grow. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Don't forget to watch the Gold Coast Lounge on Netflix. And you can also watch Black Rose. You said it's on- Yeah, Black Rose is on, it's on, it's on YouTube. Uh, but if you're in North America, in the United States, um, Gold Coast Lounge can be, can be seen on uh, topic.com. Uh, yes. But the whole of Africa, etc. you can watch it on Netflix. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Money in the stress. Money in the stress. Oh, no, no.